long as. Okay, here we go. And let's start it from the beginning. Okay, so welcome everybody. This is an introduction to the main event on Sunday, which is with uh, Dr. Wendy Lauer. She was my professor in undergrad. And so that's kind of how I got into uh, Holocaust studies actually. So I'll give you a little bit of background on that just because you all know me. And so I think it would be kind of fun so you can understand a little bit of where I'm coming from. Um, so I started with her class. Uh, I was uh, a second year and it was a small seminar class. There were about 15, 20 of, the, of us and the class was called Researching the Holocaust. And the main point of that class is really the research part, which was really fascinating to me because a lot of the history programs and a lot of the history classes that I had taken were much more focused on just like textbook types type stuff, like what, what you would read in a textbook, what, you know, Wikipedia, like whatever kind of um, timelines and histories, dates, people, that type of thing. And she really opened up this idea of doing a lot of the research and really understanding pieces that we don't get to hear all that much. Um, and so that really helped me to, to kind of better engage with the history. And so that's where I'm coming from. And, and I ended up uh, doing my graduate work and my thesis for my undergrad on the Holocaust in Lithuania. So this is on Ukraine, but my particular piece is on Lithuania. So if you're ever interested in that, feel free to email me or we can set up a time to chat. I'd love to talk with you about that. Um, but this is an introduction to her newest book called The Ravine, A Family, A Photograph, A Holocaust Massacre Revealed. And uh, this is all about a micro history of a single town in Ukraine called Mirapol. And, uh, and she dives into the various ways that she goes about researching this massacre um, and how she discovers the different things that she discovers, how she comes about them, all focusing on a single photo that she happened to come across um, in a, um, uh, while she was at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum doing her own research. Um, so the book goes back and forth between macro history and micro history. So micro history is basically what happens in that small town and, and really focuses on the massacre that happened. Um, and a macro history is looking much more broadly about um, looking at the Nazi um, plans, uh, looking at uh, uh, the geopolitics, looking at all of these kind of broad things, that's more of a macro history. And a micro history is, is really kind of like a very small piece of, of the broader picture. Uh, so she goes back and forth in her book about these two things and shows kind of the documents, the German documents she looks at, she uh, talks, she looks at the court documents, things like that. And then she also is looking at the uh, topography of the um, of the ravine and of the forest and the city. Um, and she she uh, does oral histories, she's looking at, so she has a bunch of different ways that she's doing the research. And I think that's a really strong point in her book uh, is that she really looks in every nook and cranny for anything she can find and reveals a lot from doing that and, and using that type of method. Um, so I think it's really important to pay attention to the histories of Eastern Europe. I think that we find a lot of the histories that we look at tend to be around concentration camps, around death marches, Hitler's policies, things like this that we've all heard a lot of times. And so I'd like to bring to you a little bit of a different history around Eastern Europe and around the fact that there were neighbors involved and the different collaborators that were involved that you don't really hear about as much in say the concentration camp narrative. Uh, and so, uh, one piece that that is a bit of a shocking stat that comes from Yad Vashem is that 50% um, uh, of those killed in the ravines of Ukraine have not yet been identified. And so we have, right, so there's, she has a chapter, um, Dr. Lara has a chapter called The Missing Missing. And so a lot of that is we don't know the names of any of these people. It was never documented. Um, we just have a number. And so a lot of these micro histories focus on the people, who are the people, who are the families, and, and really memorializing them through this research. 
Um, and I think that's a very strong, strong point in, um, in this book. Okay, so I'll go through the timeline of what happened so you have a better understanding of what actually happened in this town. I must warn you, it is this is Holocaust research. It is violent graphic, um, and we'll be getting to the photo as well, which is very violent. Um, so I just wanna warn you that that is coming and to be prepared for it. And if I can get my, there we go. Okay, so Sunday, October 12th, 1941. This is the day before the massacre. Uh, so a lot of these pieces are, uh, this is a common theme in what happens with, with um, killings that are, that are happening in forests outside of people's homes in Eastern Europe. And, uh, and this is uh, a lot of influence from this book, I think was taken from uh, the, the work that Father Patrick Desbois has done. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's, um, he's the head of Yahad and Unum. It's uh, an organization based, I believe in Paris, but somewhere in France. And, uh, and he's also, uh, he also is at Georgetown University and he has worked on the, um, what we call the Holocaust by bullet, which is these, these mass graves in Eastern Europe. And he has done a lot of work with a large team uh, of uncovering these graves and actually counting, um, counting people, right? And, and really understanding the, the uh, just the vast amount of, of um, research and 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 death that that happened in eastern europe right which is which is very different it happened in a very different way than it happened um in in poland and so uh so his he has a couple books holocaust by bullets and in broad daylight and in broad daylight is is his newest book that really covers a lot of this type of timeline so i'm just going to go over what happened generally uh so, so usually there, there are SS officers who come in and they survey the area. That means that they're looking for people, they're looking for a place for to put the, the pit, but they're also looking for people in the town to work on this, to dig the pit, to ha who has carts, who, um, where they're going to house and carton off Jews, right? Like all of these, all of these pieces, they come and survey that. They come in and they dig the pit, and these, um, in this case, they had young Ukrainian girls digging the pit, right from the town. Young, young girls, teenagers, um, who are digging these pits. So, and then they're acquiring um, perpetrators. In this case, they were Ukrainian policemen. Uh, they also were looking at the German um, security. Uh, uh, remind me what they're called. Um, they're the German. Um, they're part of the finance ministry and they were, uh, they basically were there by volunteering. So they asked these, these Germans who were there um, for other purposes, if they wanted to volunteer and a couple did. Uh, and then they seal the town off, Jews can no longer run away. Uh, and they forced them out of their homes into the marketplace. They housed them in the main square. And at that point, that's when a um, that's when neighbors and the Ukrainian policemen and whoever could get their hands on anything went into the homes and ransacked the homes. So that's also something to keep in mind that a lot of Jews were denounced um, or or even just not helped because their neighbors really wanted their stuff. And so there's a lot of looting that's happening too, and that happens for days. Okay, so the day of. So they're already in this, they're already in the town square. They're marching, they're now marched to the forest and the Nazis realize that the first grave is not big enough. So they have to, on the day of, dig a second grave, um, which I think is really poignant in this situation because they've already surveyed, they've already looked at the number of people they're going to kill and they realize they've done it wrong and it ends up becoming much more of a, um, this is daily life type thing for them, which is very scary, of course. So at that point, the killing begins. And of course, with the with um, shooting, you hear you hear it, it's loud. And so there were Slovakian security guards nearby, they came to investigate. And that's where uh, this photographer came in, because he was with them, he he was phot photographing for them. And uh, that's where he ended up coming in to do the photography. This is not a normal thing. Um, in almost all situations, and it had been put out many, many times by the Nazis to say no photographing allowed, and they had to say it many times, which also tells you that people were not 
actually following those rules. So the more you put it out, the more you know that the Germans, mostly German soldiers, um, were photographing. So there actually was a lot of photographing, but they weren't allowed. And in many cases, I believe those photographs were destroyed or taken away. Uh, okay, so looting continues. Um, and, and then there were bodies that are in the town. So ones who didn't make it to the town square, ones who were essentially killed the day before, um, were then taken on horse-drawn carts to the forest. Um, so they had to get Ukrainians to, to do that, right? They had to get the carts, they had to get, so that was a whole operation as well. And there's one survivor. And she has, we have oral history from her. Uh, she died in 2015. And um, she gives a very, a very good history um, and uh, of, the, of the, the place. And we can talk more about oral histories and the importance of them uh, in a bit. And then the days after the search for Jews continue and there's the covering of the mass graves. So of course with the, not necessarily of course, but if, you, if you're not understanding how the top topography works, when, when there is such a mass grave and there are people who've been shot, many of them, first of all, have not been shot completely dead. And the other piece is that they're all still moving and settling. So that means that the whole, the whole covering of the grave and everything that's there is moving for days. So this is all right. And this is all, I can see some of you, I, yeah, it's, I understand it's very, very graphic. Um, it's, it's, good to understand this though, because that means that the neighbors knew about this, right? This is all like people around knew about this. And there's of course questions around bystanders, perpetrators, collaborators, who is, who is doing what and how. Um, but it's very clear that it took a village to do. And, and that is something that's, I think really important to look at because we all have neighbors. We all have people we know. And, um, and so this was not something where Jews were carted off and nobody else was there to know about it, right? Whole village. Okay, so I'd like to go into perpetrators, bystanders, and victims. This is something that Raoul Hilberg came up with, which is three sections of people who um, in some way were, were involved in this history. Um, I have set these out to kind of ask you what you think about it. Um, so I have here that the Nazis and the Wehrmacht, which is the German army um, and the German customs officials, those are the ones who volunteered. Um, that was the word I couldn't come up with, customs. <laughs> um, uh, those were the ones who volunteered to, to go to the um, massacre. They were not required to. And the Ukrainian police, right, who we would normally call collaborators. Bystanders, we have locals, we have the grave diggers, we have the Slovakian security who heard about this and then went over uh, to see what was going on as well as the photographer. And, um, and so, and then of course, Jews as victims. I'd like to ask you, feel free to put it in the chat or if you'd like to unmute, um, what do you think about these discrete categories? Do they fit in nicely? Do you think it should be more of a spectrum? What are, what are your thoughts? I'll give you a minute. Um, I think the secure uh, the Slovakian security should be in perpetrators. Why do you think that? Because when they went to check, they helped. They started to help. So what's the difference? That's not a bystander. Right. A bystander just stands and does nothing. But a person who helps, which is like the Slovakian security, they couldn't have done it without them. That's a perpetrator. Right. That's a really good point. Um, and even, uh, even so, what, what bystanders is no longer, I would say, necessarily a uh, correct term because bystander, I would say, is therefore tacit complicity, right? By looking and standing and not doing anything, you're complicit, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Ruth. Really appreciate it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would really say that maybe these, maybe this is not really the way we should look at um, different people in the history and think about it more on a spectrum. I mean, we also have in the same way, the grave diggers, innocent Ukrainian girls forced to do this by the Nazis, right? In some ways, were they victims, right? It's a question. 
Um, and, and of course we have Jews who were also forced to dig graves and then shot afterwards. And we have this in many other instances where some Jews were trying to take advantage of others to save their own life, right? Obviously a victim. Is it on a scale or is it just victim, right? So there's, there's a lot of questions here. We, ha we have instances of perpetrators helping other people because they wanted that person to finish the sweater they were knitting for them, right? Something like that. So perpetrator completely, right? All big questions. So I just wanted to bring that up to really get you thinking about the different people in the history and how they all interact with each other and um, how choices are made. Uh, you know, whether that's about survival or taking advantage of somebody or, you know, there's all kinds of, right? These locals who are looting probably really needed it, right? Who they're very, you know, the, the town was not necessarily a wealthy town, right? So there's all of these questions as well around, around these pieces where, uh, yeah, absolutely, they were doing horrible, horrible things. I would say, let's look at it on a spectrum and have a better understanding of who these people are and what happened. And then we, and then that's where the micro histories come in that help us to say that the, the individual and the, the uh, specificity of the history is very important. Um, and that helps us to understand how Jews were perpetrated, were, excuse me, were victimized to the point of, of being killed um, at this degree. So, uh, okay, I will now, um, I will now move on to photography. We did talk about this before we started the program. Um, and this is the, this is a camera that is like the camera that uh, the photographer was using uh, in the book um, and, and obviously in the history, but the, the book, I think, I think Dr. Lauer describes it well in that she talks about the, about photography becoming a bigger and bigger piece uh, and how everybody kind of had a camera at that time. So the option to take photos was actually there. Uh, and, and the Germans basically said, you can't take photos. So the fact that this photographer, this Slovakian photographer was there and allowed to take these photos, it's very obvious that they were staged, not staged, but like he was able to set them. Like he, he didn't, they, it wasn't obscured in any way. Like normally if there was somebody who was trying to clandestinely take a photo, like you'd see, you know, a pocket or like something that was, that he was hiding it behind. And this was out in the open. Um, and so this, this is what's really interesting is we don't have a lot of photos like this because they weren't allowed. And so this is where the history really becomes so important with this photo because we're able to discover so much by it. Um, and so that's, that's the piece with the photos that I think is really, really important. Um, and, and as well, uh, that, that we're able to, we're able to use these photos to better understand the history in a way that, I think is is a question in some ways because there's the question of whether we should be looking at atrocity photos. Um, these are photos of people in the last moments of their life. And uh, in some ways can, depending on how we look at it, take dignity away from that person. Uh, and at the same time, we're able to use it for research. We're able to use it to better understand the history um, and so I think that including the history along with the photo really, um, this is what Dr. Lauer says, she, she says, restore the victims as subjects, not objects of history. And so when we look at these photos, I think we should keep in mind that we are looking at it as a way to understand the history and, and bring, a, a, um, bring justice to these people, right? Um, and so I, I would just want to it in that way and we can definitely I'd love to talk about it afterwards I'd love to hear your opinions afterwards about what you think about that it's a definitely a big discussion around photos and how we should be using them and when we should be looking at them um, and so and um, this is the photo this is the photo that the book is about um, this is this is the one from Maripol it was discovered um, somewhat recently um, by a couple journalists and and brought to Dr. Lauer and she started researching it um, so I'd like to just talk about, I'm not going to go into the analysis of the photo because she's going to do that on Sunday. Um, but these four pieces at the bottom 
uh, photo analysis, archival research, field work, and oral history are some of the main methodologies of this um, uh, of, of historical research. And, uh, and each piece brings a different light, right? So photo analysis, we can look at the different people and, and sometimes uh, we can even identify them. Uh, our, and our uh, archival research, often German documents, often Russian documents. These are, these are high, higher level um, pieces that also omit information on purpose. So that's something to think, keep in mind. Uh, field work, that's where you can actually visit the site. And that's where Yahud and Unum does their, uh, does their piece around actually measuring graves and seeing who's in them. Um, and, uh, and talking to people there, talking to locals, that type of thing, and oral history. So that was like Ludmila um, uh, Blachman. And, uh, and so that gives us an idea of uh, the actual bringing, bringing to light the actual um, connections to the victims and, and speaking it and, and the memory. And that's a lot of memory work. Um, and so these are all very, very important in the methodology and if you read her book, you will see how she uses all of them and you can also hear about it more on Sunday. Um, so I'm now going to turn it over to Barbara to give a bigger overview of um, this, this piece in a, in a broader way. Thank you, Cora. Before beginning, I would like to acknowledge in gratitude to the indigenous people on whose traditional territories I live, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, and Mississauga of Newt Credit in Tikoronto, Treaty 13. Monday, October 13, 1941, the sign of Libra. The US President was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the UK Prime Minister was Winston Churchill, and Pope Pius XII was leading the Catholic Church. Paul Simon, the singer-songwriter, was born on this day. How Green Was My Valley was one of the most viewed movies, and I Wake Up Screaming, starring Betty Grable, was released. Lana Turner and Clark Gable graced the cover of Life magazine for 10 cents, featuring the following articles. A full page bell telephone ad with a soldier from 1916 and one from 1941. The World Series between the Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Yankees, including Joe DiMaggio. Farmers were meeting in Iowa for the furrow contest on the farm of Miss Iva Turner. Hitler covets Russia's oil and manganese, and an RAF flyer describes his day, daylight raid on Germany. Where were you on this day? It was 1941 and I was not even a twinkle in my parents' eyes. They didn't get married until 1942, and I was born a year later. Next slide. In Canada, and I quote from Wikipedia, January the 1st, the CBC News Service, service officially begins operations in English with operations in French the following day. The CBC's Board of Governors determined that a national news service would assist in reporting the war. On March 4th, the RCMP began registering Japanese Canadians. On April 29th, Quebec is the last province to allow women to practice law, never mind the fact that they only got to vote the year before. The first Quebec woman lawyer is Elizabeth Carmichael Monk who is called to the bar the next year in 1942. But Hitler was well on his way to fulfilling his vision of a pure race ruling Europe, Scandinavia, Russia, North Africa, Britain, and even North America. The lightning speed with which Hitler was able to amass such an enormous number of obedient troops is truly mind boggling. Just think about it. They were everywhere in a total of 44 countries in Europe. And here in Canada, a month and a half after the Mirapol massacres, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers won their third Grey Cup by defeating the Ottawa Rough Riders 18 to 16 in the 29th Grey Cup played at Varsity Stadium. In <laughs> next, next slide. 
From history headlines, let me share with you the following information. The 10 countries that Germany could have invaded. Switzerland, despite hoping to rule it with Mussolini, it never happened and it remained neutral. Great Britain, Germany with all its effort could not defeat the, the RAF. And as an aside, in 1942, my dad joined the RCAF in Trenton as a mechanic to repair and service the hydraulic components on the airplanes, which were then sent over to Great Britain. Malta, the Nazis could not defeat the islanders or the allied garrison there. Gibraltar survived the many German and Italian attacks and could not be defeated. Spain, Portugal, and Mallorca. Franco insisted on remaining neutral even though he was sympathetic to the Nazis. Ireland, the strength of the RAF prevented a Nazi invasion despite the hostilities with Great Britain. Sweden acquiesced to all the German demands and provided tons of much needed iron ore and so was not invaded. Turkey remained neutral and prevented Hitler from realizing his dream of invading Iraq. Iceland in 1940, the RAF invaded the island before Hitler could get there. And in 1941, the US sent in Marines. And the United, the United States, Hitler had numerous dreams of isolating and invading the states, but was never able to realize those dreams. In Alex Grobman's article last month titled, The Jews of Germany, A People Apart, he wrote about the Nazi mobilization of the German bureaucracy to systematically murder every Jew under their control. Raoul Hilberg outlined the three goals of those who had oppressed the Jews. Christian missionaries effectively declared, you have no right to live among us as Jews. Secular rulers who followed asserted, you have no right to live among us. The Nazis proclaimed, you have no right to live. For Hitler, the Jews were not merely subhuman to be eliminated in the interests of an allegedly superior race. They were the world enemy of the Aryans to be hunted down and ritually humiliated before they were killed and without exception. When people are desperate, they will do irrational things. After the disaster of World War I, which left most of Eastern Europe devastated, economically destroyed and borders changed, Hitler came along as the answer to their prayers for a better life. Next slide. Hannah Arendt was a German-born American political theorist and widely considered one of the most important German philosophers and political thinkers of the 20th century. She escaped, making her way to the United States in 1941 via Portugal and settled in New York, writing Eichmann in, Jer in Jerusalem in 1963. She's best remembered for the controversy surrounding his trial with her attempt to explain how ordinary people become actors in totalitarian systems and for uttering her phrase, the banality of evil. Little did I know that at the innocent age of 17, I would be witnessing in person that historic trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem in 1961. I was in Israel for the very first time and our group was given permission to attend a short session. I have never forgotten those beady eyes and that emotionless face. Hannah Arendt said that, and I quote, the precarious balance between society and state brought about a peculiar law governing Jewish admission to society. Mm -hmm. German society made it clear that none of its classes was prepared to grant them equality, social equality. On the eve of the Nazis assuming power in 1933, Jews continued to believe that their approach to persecution, which had enabled them to endure, would once again allow them to prevail. The conviction that their success in medicine, science, commerce, and the arts had made them, quote, indispensable, unquote. Since, quote, one does not want to kill the cow, one wants to milk, 
unquote. This conviction turned out to be an illusion. Next slide. Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel explained why in Siget, Hungary at least, the Jews believed they were so essential to the well-being of their town. In Legends of Our Times, Wiesel remembered during the first years of the war, certain rumors reached us concerning what was happening in Poland. Among the Jews of Siget, these rumors roused very little anxiety, and even that was quickly forgotten. The rabbi said, nothing will happen to us, for God needs us. The merchant said, the country needs us. The doctors said, the town needs us. They all considered themselves indispensable and irreplaceable. In 1943, when certificates for Palestine were available, only one person from Siget decided to go. The others smiled. Why leave? We're all right here. The people are friendly. They cannot do without us, and they know it. And so, to put this into perspective, Dr. Lauer informs no. us in chapter right. five, the search yeah, for yeah. family, yeah. that on July 22nd, 1941, in an exchange between Hitler and his Croatian ally, Marshal Slavko Kvertinik, and I quote, Hitler spoke frankly about his intention to wipe out all the Jews on the continent of Europe. And so began the mass killing of Jews. The Germans and their collaborators hunted Jewish families down to the very last mother, father, son, and daughter. Next slide. Now let us examine the events that led to the horrific Mirapol massacres in Ukraine. From her 2005 book, Nazi Empire Building and the Holocaust in Ukraine, Wendy Lauer writes, on 16 July, 1941, Adolf Hitler convened top Nazi leaders at his headquarters in East Prussia to dictate how they would rule the newly occupied Eastern territories. Ukraine, the, East, the jewel in the Nazi empire, would become a German colony administered by Heinrich Himmler's SS and police, Hermann Göring's economic plunderers, and a host of other henchmen. Focusing on the Zhitomir region, and weaving together official German wartime records, diaries, memoirs, and personal interviews, Dr. Wendy Lauer provides the most complete assessment available of German colonization and the Holocaust in Ukraine. Mid-level managers, Lauer demonstrates, played major roles in mass murder, and locals willingly participated in violence and theft. Lauer puts names and faces to local perpetrators, bystanders, and beneficiaries, as well as resistors. In her analysis of the murderous implementation of Nazi race and population policy in Zhitomir, Lauer shifts scholarly attention from Germany itself to the Eastern outposts of the Reich, where the regime truly revealed its core beliefs aims and practices. And in her 2015 book, Hitler's Furies, where she writes about the German women in the Hitler killing fields. Fascinating. From the Holocaust Encyclopedia in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, allow me to cite the following events in as precise a chronological order that I can, preceding the Mirapol massacres of October 13, 1941 in Ukraine. Looking at World War II in depth, in a nutshell and with a lot of dates, this is a succinct resume of the events to show you the rapidity with which Germany conquered all these countries. The mass murder of Europe's Jews took place in the context of World War II. As German troops invaded and occupied more and more territory in Europe, the Soviet Union, North Africa, the regime's racial and Semitic policies became more radical, moving from persecution to genocide. The Holocaust was the state-sponsored systematic persecution and annihilation of European Jewry by Nazi Germany and its collaborators between 1933 and 1945. 
Jews were the primary victims. Next slide. Also worth noting is the German-Japanese expansion. Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan unleashed World War II with the, with the intention of establishing by military conquest, a permanent dominance over Europe and Asia, respectively as members of the Axis partnership based on anti-communism and dissatisfaction with the world order after World War I. Adolf Hitler, aimed at the acquisition of a vast new empire of living space, Lebensraum, in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And he began planning a European war from the day the Nazis came to power in late January, 1933. Imperial Japan followed a policy of military conquest with its support of its emperor, the military establishment, and many in the educational elite who sought Japanese rule throughout Asia and the Pacific Ocean. And the two nations formed an anti-communist front aimed at the Soviet Union in 1936. That same year, fascist Italy and Nazi, Nazi Germany formed the Axis Alliance shortly after Italy completed its brutal and successful conquest of Ethiopia until the British helped defeat the Italians and Emperor Haile Selassie came back from exile. Japan had initiated its policy of military conquest by invading China proper to unleash World War II in Asia. Next slide. With the invasion of Poland, Germany incorporated Austria and the Czech lands without having to resort to war. With a pact of non-aggression, Germany secured the neutrality of the Soviet Union, ruled by dictator Joseph Stalin, and so began World War II in Europe. Permitting Nazi Germany to destroy the interwar Czechoslovak state, Britain and France had guaranteed the integrity of Poland's borders in April 1939. Thus, they responded to the German invasion of Poland by declaring war on Germany. But within a month, German and Soviet forces conquered Poland and partitioned the Polish state. That's why I never knew if my grandparents came from Poland, Russia, Red Russia, White Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, they mentioned them all. As for the Russo-Finnish war, the Soviet Union invaded Finland, forcing the Finns to cede territory north of Leningrad which is now St. Petersburg, and on the Arctic coastline. The Soviet Union also occupied and annexed Eastern Poland. And with German encouragement, the Soviet Union occupied the Baltic states in June 1940, as well as Bessarabia and Northern Buk Bukovina from Romania. The invasion of Norway and Denmark by German soldiers took place on April 1940. The invasion of Western Europe began on May 10, 1940, when Germany began its assault on Western Europe by invading France and the neutral Low Countries, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg. Italy entered the war and invaded Southern France on June the 21st. Fascist dictator Benito Mussolini attacked Greece in October 1940 and the British forces in Egypt. Both adventures resulted in a military disaster that required German intervention. However, from July 10th to October 31st, 1940, the Germans waged and ultimately lost an air war over England known as the Battle of Britain. Next map, the four-pronged attack. Axis advances, Germany enticed Hungary, Romania and Slovakia to join the Axis. And in April, 1940, the next slide, please. Great. Germany, supported by Italy, Hungary, and Bulgaria, invaded and dismembered Yugoslavia. And by mid-June, the Axis powers had subdued Greece. And here's where I got totally confused and was not surprised that I never completely understood what was going on. So hang in while I try to get this right. 
Out of the collapse of Yugoslavia arose the so-called independent state of Croatia, encompassing Bosnia and Herzegovina, which formally joined the Axis on June 15th. Germany occupied Eastern Slovenia, the Serbian Banat, and most of Serbia proper. Italy seized Istria, Western Slovenia, attached the Kosovo province to Albania, and occupied the Croat Dalmatian coastline and Montenegro. Hungary annexed northeastern Yugoslavia, and Bulgaria occupied Macedonia and Serbia. Germany and Italy divided Greece into occupation zones, Italians on the west and the Germans in the east. This sounds like a game of monopoly without having to pay the bank. I know it's a lot of information to throw at you, but please stay with me. We're just getting started. Next slide. Now for the invasion of the Soviet Union. On June the 22nd, 1941, the Germans and their Axis partners invaded the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union in direct violation of that German-Soviet pact. By the end of October 1941, German troops had advanced deep into the Soviet Union, but were prevented from capturing the key cities of Leningrad and Moscow. And on December the 6th, 1941, Soviet troops launched a significant counteroffensive that drove the Germans permanently from the outskirts of Moscow. Let's remember that the United States enters World War II the next day on December 7, 1941, and that World War II resulted in an estimated 55 million deaths worldwide. Meanwhile, in Canada, between August the 9th and 12th, 1941, the Atlantic Conference meeting between Winston Churchill and Franklin Delano Roosevelt is held secretly aboard the USS Augusta docked in Ship Harbor, Placentia Bay, Argentia, in the Dominion of Newfoundland, not yet a province. The leaders discuss Lend-Lease, the war in Europe. It was the first of nine wartime meetings between FDR and Churchill, who publicly issued the Atlantic Charter a joint declaration including freedom of the seas, self-determination, free government, and liberal trade. On August the 12th, all Japanese Canadians were ordered to carry identity cards with their thumbprint and photo. Now in the invasion of the Soviet Union, June 22, 1941, Nazi Germany launched a surprise attack on its ally in the war against Poland. How ironic. By the end of the year, German troops had advanced hundreds of miles into the outskirts of Moscow. Soon after the invasion, mobile killing units began the mass murder of Soviet Jews. Here are three key facts to be aware of. The destruction of the communist Soviet Union and the conquest of Lebensraum, living space, the seizure of prime land for Germans in Eastern Europe were longtime goals of Hitler and the Nazi party. Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union, known as Operation Barbarossa, is considered to be one of the largest military operations in the history of modern warfare. And the German attack on the Soviet Union marked a turning point in the history of World War II and the Holocaust. Hitler had always regarded the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact as a temporary tactical maneuver. And so he decided to attack the Soviet Union with the intention to wage a war of annihilation against both the Soviet Union's Judeo-Bolshevik communist government and its citizens, particularly the Jews. The deployment of Einsatzgruppen, consisting of 3,000 men behind the front lines, began during the winter and spring months of 1941, when they would conduct mass shootings of Jews and communists. These mobile killing units were, spe were special units of the security police and the security service. With 134 divisions at full fighting strength and 73 more divisions of deployment behind the front, 
German forces invaded the Soviet Union with more than 3 million German soldiers and 650,000 of their allied troops. And the front stretched from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south. Heinrich Himmler's representatives arrived in the Soviet Union and began to shoot entire communities there, in addition to deporting German Jews to the occupied Soviet Union, beginning on October 15, 1941, to the Lebensraum, that living space, two days after the Mirapol massacre. This decision initiated the policy that would become known as the final solution which was the physical annihilation, not only of Jews in the German occupied East, but of Jews throughout Europe. In the summer of 1942, Germany reached out the outskirts of Stalingrad, approximately 120 miles from the shore of the Caspian Sea. This marked the furthest geographical extent of German domination in Europe during World War II. Next slide the Holocaust in Ukraine. From Wikipedia, Zhitomir, you see it in the center there, was one of the prominent cities of Kievan Rus. And the first records of the town date from 1240, when it was sacked by the Mongol hordes of Batu Khan in Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, and Russia. During World War II, the Zhitomir region was Heinrich Himmler's Ukrainian headquarters becoming what historian Wendy Lauer describes as a laboratory for the elimination of the Jews and German colonization of the East. It transformed the landscape and devastated the population to an extent that was not experienced in other parts of Nazi-occupied Europe, besides Poland. After the Soviet Union defeated Nazi Germany, Zhitomir fell under Soviet rule and became part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic again. However, on the 24th of August in 1991, the Ukrainian parliament announced the Declaration of Independence of Ukraine. Notice it's not the Ukraine anymore. We don't use the the. It's independence of Ukraine because it's a country. And Zhitomir has been part of the independent and sovereign Ukraine. Up until today, where Russia is beginning to exert its strength again. Now let us return to 1941 from the Holocaust Encyclopedia and look at Ukraine's complicated history. Ukraine was subsumed into Poland in the West and the Soviet Union in the East where millions of men, women, and children died in the breadbasket of Europe, as it was known. On the eve of the invasion in 1941, Ukraine was the home of the largest Jewish population in Europe. While scholars are still researching the scale of the Holocaust in Ukraine, they estimate that at least one and a half million Jews were killed there. What we do know is that the Einsatzgruppen, the mass killing groups, arrived with orders to identify the Jews and recruit local collaborators. Most Jews in Ukraine were shot to death close to where they lived, not deported to distant camps. Their executioners were Germans, but also Ukrainian, Russian, and other local collaborators often neighbors. Next slide, please. Recent studies, be prepared for this, please. It's terrible. Recent studies of the Holocaust as it occurred in the Soviet territories have shifted attention from the central German leadership to the role of regional officials and administrators. In Shitomir, the presence of Himmler and Hitler created a unique setting in which the inter interaction of local collaborators can be traced. On this basis, and with the use of the new handheld Zeiss Icon Contacts camera, the author argues for the reconsideration of Berlin's role in the regional events. And you are looking at the proof. 
Last month, this headline appeared, quote, 80 years later, Ukraine inaugurates historical monument to Babinyar victims, unquote, written by Jacob Judah. Ukraine unveiled a monument to the 33,000 Jews killed in Babinyar, the ravine near Kiev by Nazis and local co collaborators in September 1941, a month before the Mirapol massacre. Rabbi Yitz Greenberg said, and I quote, learning about the Holocaust is important morally and ethically, not to forget the victims and to make sure that their lives are not wiped out. It's about turning death into life, hatred and discrimination into love and human responsibility. To study the Holocaust, one emerges bruised, one emerges hurt. At the same time as we study the response, it gives us strength. It gives us a direction for how to improve the world and repair it." Unquote. I read that recently, every single one of us on screen today and all Jews in the world have personally been affected by the Holocaust. That really puts it into perspective. Just as Amalek came at the Israelites from behind to destroy them, so did Hitler come for the Jews in an unbelievable determination to eliminate them completely. Now with Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran intent upon doing the same, we cannot let them become another Amalek or Hitler. With the worldwide spread of anti-Semitism so prevalent, we need to be vigilant. We need to be vocal. We need to be voracious in our pursuit to eliminate this threat to our existence. Last slide. My dad, Sidney Lawrence Wax, was named after his maternal great-grandfather, Rav Alexander Zisman Kaufman of Zhitomir, Ukraine. My mom, Lillian Lisa Moskov Wax, who arrived in Halifax in 1925, was named after her paternal aunt, Leah Moskievich from Vilna, Lithuania. And how personal this research became for me as I was reminded that my paternal grandmother, Bessie Kaufman Wax, for whom our daughter Tamara Batya is named, arrived at Ellis Island in 1911 from Zhitomir, one year after my grandfather, Jacob Wax. Our son, David Bryan, is named after his maternal great-great-grandfather, Rav Dov Bear from Minsk, Belarus. His maternal great-grandfather is Sai Moskov from Vilna, Lithuania, and then Lunyanets, Belarus, whose Jews were massacred two months before Mirapol. And David's paternal great-grandmother, Bryna Handelsman, from Regine, Redzine, Poland. I am named after my great-grandmother, Bela Rodman Klaas from Lunyanets Korzhanovodok, Belarus. And you, after whom are you named? Tomorrow is Remembrance Day. Let us remember those law, innocent lost souls in unmarked graves throughout the world who have been deprived of passing on the keepsake of their names and family. May their souls rest in peace. May their memories be for a blessing. And let us say, Amen. Back to you, Cora. Thank you, Barbara. Um, okay, so a lot of heavy material. Um, if you want to go into gallery view so we can all see each other and talk for a little bit. Um, I know we're towards the end of our time, but I'm happy to stay on if you would like to stay. 
um, and open it up for questions and discussion. Hi, it's, it's Ellie. One thing well, this shows is many of the Germans and the Polish, and I'm assuming the Ukraines said, we didn't know or we didn't do this study. And this photograph shows it all. The military did their job, but so did the bystanders do their job. And there were many of them. Uh, just wondering, has this book come to light at all in the Ukraine? It's a great question. Uh, I do not know specifically, but I am happy to find that out for you. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. The book just came out in February, so oh. it will be interesting to see the ramifications of it. If they even allow it. It's true. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we know oh. the Polish have not yet. Yeah, I'll look into it. Yeah. I just want to commend Barbara and Cora for the work you did on this. You're really good. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Bravo. Oh, my. Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. Uh, I have a question. Were any of the, the, um, the Jews who were uh, killed in the mass graves, any of them have been um, buried properly? You know? Great question. And it's something that is a, a big question in the Jewish community because the way it's supposed to be is once you're in the ground, you're not supposed to be removed, right? So there's a question around, around whether those bodies should be moved. And there's also the bodies are not really there anymore, right? They were, they're, they're bones now. Um, and so the question is, should the bones be moved? And according to Jewish law, no, they shouldn't. And so it's actually a big question with Yahud and Unum as well, because they are exhuming these graves to see the numbers of people and how big the graves were and these types of things. And of course, you're not supposed to do that in Jewish law. So there, there's actually a kind of a discussion around that. Um, so I think for the most part, no, they have not been. Or, at, or else just on, on site to erect something with names on it. Yeah, that, that has happened in many, many places. They have a, they will put a memorial up or they will put um, some sort of sign up or some something up because, for that, yeah. But the difficulty there is that numerous bodies were never named. Uh, Cora, uh, you mentioned that there was one survivor of that massacre in October of 1941. Do you have any information as to how she managed to survive? Yes, uh, it's actually in the book. Um, it, it's uh, she essentially she was buried alive and and was able to pull herself out of the pit um, and oh. hide in the forest. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Or I also read part of it that the Germans didn't waste bullets on children. That's correct. Yeah. So they were pulled into the mass grave by, I guess, the parents. Yeah. And I guess eventually suffocated. That's right. Many of them were suffocated or crushed. Yeah. So she was, she was lucky, right? She was able to pull herself out. And in the book, she describes it as, as um, the other people were able to also push her up who were, who were essentially dying in the pit. So was she a teenager, a young woman? Well, she, um, I'm going to have to go back and look at it, but she was, I, I believe she was younger. Um, I mean, she must have, she, she would have had been. to be younger because sure. she, she died been. in 2015. Yeah. So um, I, I, I can go back and check her specific age. But I don't, I don't remember it right I'll here. look it up in the book too. But it was amazing how Wendy Lauer was able to find her and track her down. That, that was unbelievable to follow the process. Do you know, do you know where she lived? Oh, I forget. I forget. We could find the out. other person she tracked down was in Michigan, right. but she wasn't in the city. She had family members, right? Um, I will look it up and send it to you, Anna. Okay, thanks. I have to go, but I do appreciate what you've got. Thank thanks you for so spending much. time with us. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you Thanks. both.
Thank you very much, Cora. Barbara, excellent. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's great. Wonderful. Take care and stay well, it everybody. Was beautiful. Thank stay you. well. What time is the program on Sunday? 7.30. Uh, and I do want to mention you need to go on early and actually register and sign up for an account, with the virtual J. It's not as easy as it is through us. So go on and, and make an account and then you can see the live stream. If you don't do that, then you won't be able to actually see the live stream. I know that we've had people who it's been difficult for. So, you know, if you're able to figure it out, great. If not, I'm going to try and get a recording for later, but I'm not positive I can get that. So, um, so yeah, try and register with the virtual J first. That is the, um, that's very important to be able to see the event. Yeah. You have to create an account so that you're part of the system. It took me three tries, <laughs> but that's because I'm technically challenged <laughs> and will fully admit it. You're not alone. <laughs> I know.